bless the Lord. I've come to lift my voice. I don't know what you've come to do. I don't know what you look at each other and say, I don't know what you've come to do. I don't know what you've come to do. I've come to clap my hands. I've come to stomp my feet. I've come to bless the Lord. I've come to lift my voice. This is the day. This is the day. This is Bless the Lord. I've come to lift my voice. I've come to clap my hands. I've come to stomp my feet. I've come to bless the Lord. 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 You come to bless the Lord. You come to bless the Lord. I don't. I don't know what you come to do. 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 I don't know what you I come to clap my hand. I come to stop my feet. I come to bless the Lord. 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 I've come to bless the Lord. I've come to bless His name. I've come to bless the Lord. I've come to bless the Lord. This is the day. This is the day. This is that the Lord has made. That the Lord has. I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad. This is. Cathedral is a church in the community for the community. So a church like that has got to be on the move. Hallelujah. That's all I was trying to get y'all to do, to move. Hallelujah. Because God is on the move. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are here to declare the goodness and the greatness of God. Hallelujah. And we are going to tell the whole world what he has done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Didn't he wake you up this morning? He put you in your right mind. You got to clothe yourself. You got to feed yourself. Hallelujah. And you know, uh, uh, there are probably people that are shut in and we're praying with them, but this is a time to count our blessings. Hallelujah. I don't know. It's, it's a little surreal for me to be standing here. Uh, you know, I'm the kind of person that likes to sit back and enjoy and watch skillful people do their thing. But I have work to do up here. Amen. Because God has been so good to me. He's been so good to you. When I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for us, when I think about where the Patricks began, hallelujah, we were once QC Sears, hallelujah, and here you are. God has brought great people to work with them, hallelujah. When I think of the, every time I think about these things, I think about the goodness of God. When personal journey. I think about the goodness of God. Didn't he make a way? Didn't he make a way for you? I know he made a way for me. So let's tell the whole world how great God is because we know him as the way maker. 
maker. Hallelujah. He is the way maker. Hallelujah. I feel him here in this place. Do you feel him? Hallelujah. He's worthy. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord, that no matter what, you are here. You are here. Two or three gathered together. You are here. You are here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I worship you, I worship you, if you know it, sing it with me. share a very brief testimony. I was sharing a little bit with Pastor Paul about our group trip to Maine. Hallelujah. I'm going to be brief. Needless to say, what was supposed to be a five-hour journey to South Boston turned into a full day. Because of inclement weather, it came to a full stop. And there, there was temptation for frustration. But we, as praying God-believing people, decided by faith that God made a reason for the occasion. Hallelujah. Because the trees could have fallen down on us, right? There could have been fire on the tracks. But for whatever reason, God averted all of that and kept it. And there was a little light ministry because we decided to just sing praises, me and my mom. And before you know it, there was a conductor standing behind me. He wanted to join in. Three other conductors came. We almost formed a band. We could have taken this on the road. We were already there. And uh, fast forwarding now, when we got to our destination, sort of, we were 20 minutes out from the hotel. A couple of our travel partners decided to go to a nearby pizzeria. And before you know it, in, in, in addition to coming back with pizza, they came back with two complete Caucasian strangers who were willing to take us to the hotel, free of charge. So I'm saying all this to say, like Esther, God works in the background. You may not see it, but he never stops working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Come on now, he never stops working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. He never stops. He never, never stops. He never stops. He never stops. Even when I don't see it, he's working. Even when I don't see it, he's working. You never stop. He never stops. He never, never. 
never stops, he never stops, he never, never, never stops working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. No music, no music. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never, never stop working. You never stop, you never, never music working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're always working. You never stop, you never, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop. It is his nature. He never stops. He never stops working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even you never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. I feel like God is doing something through this song. So ladies, keep singing that. You never stop, you never stop working. Keep singing. You never stop. No matter what I do up here, keep singing that. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Keep going until I tell you to stop. You never stop. That is his nature, because he never stops, even when you can't see it, even when you can't feel it, God, when? God, why? God, how? Because he never, he never stops, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, he's always working for you, hallelujah. You never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop, even when, even when I don't feel it, you're working, even when I don't see it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, even when you don't feel it, you're working, even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, my God, that is who you are. Give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't God good? Isn't he good? Hallelujah. I bless the Lord. 
Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory be to your name, Jesus. You're worthy. Hallelujah. I love you, Lord. Hallelujah. For your mercy never fails. You can sing it if you want. All my days I've been held in your wonderful hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God all my life. All my life, you have. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness
church. Hallelujah. I know today I'm going to go into overflow because I am already full and the word hasn't even come yet. So I know I will have much to give this week because I'm going to be in overflow. Amen. I jot some, some notes as it came to me while we were worshiping. And I was just amazed as how God just speaks to his people and just reach us in every aspect that we give to him from the prayer to the worship team, to everything. And I am just truly blessed. You may have your seats. And I started and I wrote, and I thought about this week, this coming week, because we've been through last week already, right? But now we've come because some of us were left empty and some of us were just there. And now we have come back, we've pressed and we've pushed into God's house and he's pouring again to us. And Satan is gonna come again this coming week, right? But the word that came through the ministry of worship said, Satan, this I put Satan name in it, right? The worshiper said, I don't know what you want to do. But I said, Satan, when he comes this week, that's what I got. Satan, I don't know what you come to do, but this is the day that the Lord has made. I I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? That's what I got this morning. That's what I got. And even when I don't see it, he's working, right? Even when I don't feel it this week, he's working. He'll never stop. He'll never stop. He'll never stop working. So Satan, I don't know what you're planning for me. I don't know what you're planning this week, but this is the day Be glad in it. Amen? Amen. That's what I got. Amen. But I'm here to do the announcements. <laughs> glory, 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 glory. The Lord has spoken. The Lord has spoken. Amen? Here are the announcements for the week of August 27th, 2023. Welcome, Destiny. Another welcome, right? I'm just, I'm just so full and excited. But, <laughs> and the word hasn't come yet, so. Whew. Welcome Destiny, to Destiny Cathedral Sunday Worship. We are delighted that you could join us today. We also welcome everyone joining us via YouTube. Our prayer is that you will be edified by our time of worship together. Amen? Last Sunday, we had a large contingency of members and attendees who visited with us at the Mayfair Care Center. We especially are thankful for our youth for participating in this vital ministry. Our young people were out 
and showed up last week. So we give God thanks for them. The family of the late or late brother Clifford McCullough expresses their sincerest thanks to the family of Destiny Cathedral for your prayers and support during this time of bereavement. And may we continue to keep them in our prayer also. All three of our college students have now arrived at their respective schools. Amen. It is now up to us to continually keep them in our prayers. Amen. For their success and protection. May the Lord extend a special blessing to everyone who was a part of their send off. Amen. Amen. Children's Church will not be held today. If you desire that your child or children get to know God better, bring them out to worship. Pardon me for not looking at you. I don't have my glasses, so I have to <laughs> stick to the paper. I'm so sorry. Uh, bring them out to worship. We have a session designed for the children where they can learn God's word and discover his will for their lives. Amen? Amen. Today, we will be receiving two new members into fellowship at Destiny. <laughs> Our hearts rejoice as the Lord continues to build his kingdom through this ministry, amen? Amen. Join us tomorrow for noonday prayer. There's all, this is always a precious time of intercession in the middle of the day on Monday. So if you're free, you have lunch, join us. We're all blessed when we get together, amen? amen. If you are born again and desire to be water baptized, or if you're being led to become a member of Destiny Cathedral, we invite you to complete an application form for membership and baptism. These forms are available on our website or at the front desk. This coming Tuesday at 7.30, the study in 1 Corinthians continues in chapter 3. This is a practical study in the scriptures, and we're looking forward to everyone's contribution. If you desire to know the Lord, if you desire to understand the word of God, to appropriately apply to your life, this is the opportunity here at Destiny for you to come and dig deeper into the word of God. Amen? Amen. This Thursday, we will be in the prayer room from 9, 9 p.m. sorry, to 9.30 p.m. on Zoom. God is still answering prayers as we gather. Amen? Amen. Your faithful contribution to the ministry are important and greatly appreciated. You can con contribute by way of Zelle or PayPal by using the email contact at destinycathedral.org or by way of checks or money orders payable to Destiny Cathedral, Inc. Mail all contributions to Destiny Cathedral, Inc., 536 South Franklin Street, Hempstead, New York, 11550. Remember, all your contributions to Destiny Cathedral are tax deductible. Amen? Amen. To guide us in our giving, because we want to do everything according to the word of God. And I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Um, I'm going to read a little more than we usually do, just because it spoke to me as I was reading it. And I'll just share also. Amen? First, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting at verse 7. Thank you. If we could just rise as we just get our hearts ready. Knowing that what we do, we don't do it because man says so, but because we, are, we want to be obedient to the word of God. Amen? It says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly 
so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now, he, the scripture continues to say, and this is the part that I want us to just think about a little bit more as we prepare our hearts to give into the kingdom of God. In verse 10, it says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us. That is, it's Paul speaking. So he's speaking of the leaders of the church, the ones who are entrusted to collect these funds, these monies, right? To us, in our case, it would be our, our pastor, Reverend Dr. Paul Patrick, right? So that us, through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. The leaders, when we give our funds, we're entrusting them to use it in such a way that it will bring thanksgiving to God. And in verse 12, it continues and it says, this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Our gifts, even as we give them today, not only benefit us as believers or believers outside, but it also reaches unbelievers, persons outside the church, and it will result in thanks to God. Can you imagine the power of what we are about to do right now? Verse 13, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. We're required to do this. And when we do it, we're acting in obedience to the word of God. And for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. Verse 14. And in your prayers, in their prayers, so as we give and people are thankful, they actually pray, they give thanks to God in prayer. Can you imagine how we're reaching People who don't, yeah, we don't see inside the walls of the church just by what we will do in this very moment. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Verse 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Our giving is an appropriate response for what God has already done for us through his son. And despite all the benefits, all the things that we see will happen, God still says, he does not want us to give grudgingly. He does not want us to be forced to give, not out of compulsion, or giving should be one out of generosity. Let us bow our hearts before the Lord. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are just in awe of you, in all that you do, mighty God. Even as you have told us through your word, mighty God, that the very seed that we have, the things that prosper us, that you gave it to us, mighty God, you reminded us. And that even as we give, that you will restore those seed, mighty God. Father, we just want to give you thanks for all that you do for all that you continue to do for us. Father, we pray that even as we've just searched your word, that our hearts, mighty God, will be open to give into your kingdom. Knowing, mighty God, that it's not about us, it's about your word. It's about the people, the souls that will be reached, mighty God, by the thing that we will do right now collectively as a body. So we give you thanks and we give you praise, mighty God. Father, we pray even now that you'll cover the leader of this church who has the responsibility, mighty God, to prayerfully seek you, mighty God, 
to diligently use these resources that you've given to your people who are generously given into this body, into your kingdom, mighty God, that he will use it wisely. He will use it, mighty God, only after seeking you, mighty God, after hearing from you. And we pray, mighty God, even as he is obedient to your word, that not only will your church be blessed, your local church here, but your kingdom, mighty God, will expand. That this kingdom, mighty God, will reach the people that we need to reach you so we can utter, mighty God, and they can utter thanksgiving unto you. A God, mighty God, they might not even yet know. So we just want to honor your word even now, mighty God, and we just thank you. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you, mighty God, for giving our hearts our hearts that are willing to serve you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, O oh God, that you remember those who are still employed in our midst, mighty God, that even as they desire to sow into your kingdom, to reach souls, mighty God, that you will bless them financially so that they will be able to be fruitful in your kingdom. We just want to thank you and praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Please follow the instructions of the ushers. so powerful praise the lord thank you for allowing us to worship with you today we just want to continue to clear the declare the greatness of god thank you lord for teaching us how to be stewards for you we declare your greatness how great is our god the splendor of a king clothed in majesty Splendor of a king, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all.
Thank you, musicians. You are you rock. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. How great. How great is our God. Come on, let's give the Lord. Let's give our great God a round of applause. God truly is great. Who would imagine that this past week we were wondering what is going to happen this week for worship and praise? Because our team, our original team, is on vacation still. And I want to thank those who came and supported Sister Rosalind and Sister <laughs> Sheila. Come on, let's put our hands. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you want to sit and listen to this uh, This wonderful singer and worship worshiper lead a whole concert in singing and praise this morning we're gonna call her back and lead a whole concert of praise <laughs> praise the lord thank you so much sister Rosalind. amen it looks easy but you come up here and try to do that <laughs> you come up here and try to do that we want to thank you we want to thank the harper family to stand please stand we love you we appreciate you <laughs> praise the lord Amen. Sister Rosalind, Sister Rosalind was our very first worship leader at QCC when we started. I won't tell you how long ago, but I believe she was still a teenager at the time. All right? But uh, we thank God. We thank God that we still have that type of relationship that she can come back 20 something years later on and lead worship. Amen. Amen. This is what it's all about. This is what it is all about. God is good. Well, good Sunday to everyone. Destiny Cathedral, who's here, and the folks who are there online, we bless God for you. We are grateful for you. Amen. And truly, God is great. We've had the privilege of having a wonderful musician filling in for Minister Jackie. Come on. Let's put our hands together for our brother... Philip Henry. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You talk about dedication. Uh, the Hoppers were here this morning at, what time it was when they got here? 9.30. They were here before 9.30. They were supposed to be picked up at 9.30, and they were here at 9.30 this morning. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And Brother Philip comes early for rehearsal and prepares. Amen. Thank you, Brother Philip. Don't you want to keep him? And listen, he doesn't have to stay on the keyboard. He plays the bass. And you know how Pastor loves the bass. Amen. Amen, brother. Come on back. Come on back. We thank God for Brother Frank Samuels. Dedicated. And I heard, I, I, was, heard, I was hearing a little reggae in there, brother. I heard you. I heard you. I was heard. I was hearing you looking at Sister Paulette. <laughs> yeah, we love it. We love it. I believe the house of God ought to be rocking for Jesus. Rocking. Glory. Rocking for Jesus. 
Come on, come on. When we go, people going to see Beyonce and all these people, they're tearing their clothes off and falling on the ground. And come on. They can't do anything that Jesus can do for us. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Thank God, thank God. So when we come in the house of God to worship the Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, we ought to give our best to him. Amen. Brother Philip didn't come along, and he didn't come along last week either. Believe it or not, his, by the way, his birthday was last week. I told him if he had known, we would have given him a shout out. Belated greetings, my brother. Last Sunday. And uh, we learned last week that there's a wonderful lady who sings too. She's a singer. We, we were trying to recruit her this past week, but she's challenged with her voice a bit. His sister is here. And uh, she, uh, she said she couldn't come to sing, but I heard, I told her, your brother's going to be here again playing. She said, I'll try to make it. Stand, sis. Please stand. And you came with your friend. Praise the Lord. Both of you, please stand. God bless you. Both for coming back into the house of the Lord. Listen, this, this pastor don't play. You're lucky since the rising came because we would have had you up here. Amen. Okay. You want to you wanna sing something for us? Okay, we can, we can have you do something right before the word of God comes. All right? So let your brother know what you're going to do. I'm sure he'll be able to follow. That'd be awesome. See what the Lord does? See what the Lord does? Amen. So, a couple of things we want to, a couple of uh, items of housekeeping. We want to thank all of our team for being here for the family uh, on Friday for the, for, for the service. And uh, I don't know what many, where many of you were, but I tell you, we went over to the house and uh, we had a real, <laughs> Sister Paula, we were looking for you. We had a real time over there. I mean, it was a celebration. Man lived 99 years and nine months. And he lived for the Lord. That's the beautiful part. Live for the Lord. So we didn't come here to mourn. We didn't come here to cry. We came here to celebrate a life that was well, well lived. Amen, amen, amen. God to God be the glory. Do we have any first timers in the house today? Any, any first timers in the house? Praise the Lord, sis. We are delighted that you are here with us today. We know that the Lord did not, you didn't come here by chance, but the Lord led you here for a purpose. We know you've been ministered to already, and we pray that whatever message the Lord has for you, you will receive it. Open your heart, and the Lord will make it clear to you what his will is for your life. God bless you. The ushers are coming to give you a visitor's packet. Please complete the visitor's card that's in it there. Leave it with the ushers before you leave, and we will use this card to remember your visit with us. Come on, let's make her feel welcome. <laughs> Praise God. And all of our regulars, all of our regulars, we thank God. We thank God for you. Our young men are off to school. Today I've come, before the word comes, to receive new members in our church. Amen? Come on, you should be excited. Praise the Lord. We've come to receive new members into our fellowship, and um, we are so glad for this young couple that has been coming to our church for the last few months. Just a few months. Didn't take them long to make up their minds, you see, because they, they, they already knew the Lord. They knew what they were looking for, and I believe they came and found what they're looking for. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. And so they have uh, gone through the new members class. We, we don't just bring people into church and say, well, you're a member of the church. No, we prepare them for membership, let them come to understand what it's all about, and then encourage them to use the gifts, talents, and abilities that God has entrusted to every believer. Every believer in the house of God has a gift to be, to be used in the house of God. So we can ask them to come at this time, uh, Brother Dylan, Brother, Brother uh, Coyote, uh, Coyote Dylan and Sister Naomi Dylan, and they're coming with their little one. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. We are excited about you and for you. 
Amen. We thank God for you. Praise God. And, uh, and they're related to uh, Sister Versi, Minister Versi. So they're not, they're not complete strangers here in the body of Christ. The Word of God says that just as a body, though one, has many members, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, but all its members, mem all of its member parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. Did you hear that? Many parts. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. And if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts, of, uh, the, uh, parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. He has placed you in the body of Christ, just as he wanted you to be. And if there were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Let's say it together, many parts, but one body. This couple, though they were, though they were um, babysitting, six o'clock last Monday evening. It was last Monday evening, right? They took the time to join and be a part of the membership class, the new members class. And and I want to say, if you are here today and you are born again and you are not baptized, um, can I tell you the truth? Can I tell you the truth today? If you're born again and not baptized, you're playing games. You're playing games. Playing games. Because if you're really born again, you want to be baptized. And the water is right there and it's always warm. All right? So stop playing games. Let's get serious. All right? And if you are not a member of the local church, but a member of the universal church only, then you need to have covering. You need to have a local church that will care for you. And you need to have accountability to a local assembly that will hold you accountable to live a life honorable and pleasing to God. So these folks have taken the time to do so and we are grateful for that. And this is the covenant that they are entering into. And I want to read the covenant, remind us of the covenant, and then they are going to respond to the questions. Having been led, they're saying as they stand before us, having been led, as I believe, individual, by the Spirit of God, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, and on the profession of my faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I do now, in the presence of God, the angels, and this assembly, most joyfully continue in covenant with one another as one body. Secondly, I engage, therefore, this is what they're saying, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, to walk in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, comfort, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, doctrine, to contribute careful, cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. Thirdly, they're also saying that I also will engage to maintain family worship and secret devotions. That is, take time for the family, my brother, my sister. Bring the family together. And even though the family comes together to study the Word of God, to read the Word together, to talk about God's Word, you are still going to take time for yourself. Because there are things that God will say to you privately that He will not say to you publicly. You're listening now. He will not say to you collectively. So, 
So you maintain family worship, secret devotions, to seek the salvation of my kindred and uh, acquaintances, to walk circumspectly in the world, and to be just in all my dealings, faithful in all my engagements, and avoid all tattling and backbiting and excessive anger, to abstain from the sale and the use of intoxicating substances, and to be zealous in my efforts to advance the kingdom of God. You see a number of things about this here. I saw our grandchildren, we, we're blessed today to have our grandchildren in the house of God today. Four, four of them, four of them are with us today. And today, the, the little one, the littlest one, she was concerned that she didn't have offering to put into the offering plate, because all the others had offerings. <laughs> I wanna, I'm saying that to, to say to you, when you teach your children, when you teach your children to honor God, to respect God, the fear of God, no police officer, no judge in the courthouse. You listening? No penal system will have to take them and put bangles on their hands and reprimand them. Teach your children the fear of God while there's room for them to receive. All right? Yesterday I was driving and I noticed, I noticed that there were places we wanted to pick up a birthday card. And I, we noticed that many places that were once um, Korean stores, where you could buy vegetables and fruits. There was a couple of years ago when they, those Korean stores disappeared from Queens. And now, and then those stores were replaced with corner stores, corner shops, bodegas. Now I notice the bodegas are gone and you have the smoke shops. I saw places closed up yesterday, closed down, and now they said, a smoke shop is coming. You know what the smoke shops are? They're selling marijuana legally. And everywhere you're driving, your cars, you're smelling this garbage. You're driving your cars, you're getting high without even buying it. Anyhow, so we are committed to be different. We are committing to be different. We don't want to engage in using things that we don't have control of the Spirit of God is in us, and that's all we need. That's who we need. Amen? Amen. Fourthly, they're saying, I further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness, to cultivate Christian sympathy in, in feeling and slow in speech, to be slow to take offense. I say that again. To be slow to take offense. I say it again. To be slow to take offense. Yes. To be slow to take offense. Yes. Yeah. But always ready for reconciliation. How I many know we're not always right? I'm not always right. My wife can tell you that. <laughs> All right? We're not always right. But when we're wrong, we need to acknowledge. Right? And to be mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure it without delay. And I noticed our photographer is on the job today. I'm more for, moreover engaged uh, that if I move now, if I move from this place, we had a few folks who moved from New York City, they moved to California recently, moved to Georgia recently, different places. So what you're saying is if you move from this place, I will soon as possible unite with some other church to carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. But I know that some of those folks who moved out are watching us now. And the beautiful thing about YouTube and Zoom and social media is that, you know, you don't have to necessarily be, can be in a church to be in church, all right? But it is, we'll be happy to have you with us. You know who you are, but this covenant requires you also to seek to find a church that you can serve with your gifts and talents and abilities. Even though Destiny Cathedral is a hard church to replace. I, I'm not boasting with pride. I'm not, I'm not boasting. I'm not saying this pridefully. I can call nine out of 10 persons who have gone from this church 
And when they come back and they visit, they say, nowhere is like Destiny Cathedral. Am I right, Harper family? Bless God. Well, this is the covenant, and now we want to ask you some questions, and then we are going to have our board come and give you the right hand of fellowship, receive you into fellowship. Are you committed to living your life according to biblical standards as you have been instructed? Good. Do you understand the covenant you are entering into? And are you committed to upholding it with the help of the Lord? Wonderful. Will you recognize the pastor, uh, the leaders of this church, as those who are responsible to encourage you, to counsel you, and to correct you when necessary, if necessary, because it is our spiritual responsibility to care for your soul? Amen. We're going to ask the church to stand, and I'm going to ask the board to come and stand behind them at this time. We're going to pray with this family. This is a very serious step in their spiritual walk. And many folks who join churches and they leave the church because of what is called church hurt. We don't want ever this, we don't want this family to ever have to leave this church because under those types of circumstances. Just as we have taught them that we are here to care for them, we want to demonstrate that care and that love. Thank you, Sister Rhonda, for sharing that text. So appropriate for today. Beyond everything else, we need love in our hearts for our brothers and our sisters. So we're going to pray at this time. And by the way, after we pray, we have your, your old packets ready for you that we didn't give you last week. And we have also your membership certificates. And by the way, next week come because we're going to have a baby dedication. Guess whose baby? I wouldn't tell you. Try to figure that out. Father God, we are so grateful today. Our hearts rejoice. Our hearts rejoice because this is the work of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for our brother Coyote. We thank you for Sister Naomi. Thank you for the baby, Lord. We thank you for this family. This family that is intelligent, this family that is serious about worshiping God, this family that doesn't come from around the corner, they come from a distance, but they have found this assembly, this local assembly. I pray, oh God, that the teaching and the preaching that comes from this ministry, the worship that comes from this ministry, will always be edifying to their souls. I pray, oh God, that each time they come to this assembly, regardless of the circumstances or the conditions, that they will be uplifted and leave this house with excitement, with a sense of expectation, with a sense of jubilation, that they will leave this house each time they leave with the purpose to fulfill the Great Commission. Go, therefore, into all the world and live and preach the gospel. Compel men and women to come into the ark of safety. I pray, oh God, that they will live lives that are exemplary, not only in the church, but also on their jobs, in their community, their home. I pray, God, that they would build a home life that would include the Spirit of God, include the Word of God, include the presence of Almighty God. That they will not make any decisions ex before they consult with you, Spirit of God, because you dwell in them already. And so, God, we cover them today in your precious blood. We cover them, Lord God. Keep them as they go out. Keep them as they come in. Cause them to know that they have a, a house, a church, where, where there's security, where there's safety, where there's counsel, where there's instruction, and where there's edification, that they can be built, and where they can be the best Christians, the best family that they can be for God's glory. And everyone says... Amen and amen. Amen. Welcome, my brother, into the family of God here at Destiny. Welcome, my sister. Welcome, too. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. The board is going to extend the right hand. What a fellowship. What a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms what a piece of leaning on the everlasting 
Lean arms, lean in, lean in. Safe and secure from all alarm. Lean in, lean in, lean in on the everlasting arm. See, Pastor is trying to sing too. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. And today we are so blessed to have uh, Sister Pauline. She's going to come in a moment. Don't leave yet, brother. <laughs> come. You can do your song right after you finish your song and bless us. Uh, and also, uh, Reverend Sandra is going to bring the word. But please, we want to have all of our members welcoming our new family into the fellowship. Shake their hands. Get to know them. Greet them. Let them know that they are welcome here at Destiny cathedral amen? amen praise the lord praise the lord and then there's this little special treat later on for the children i believe mainly the ch mainly the children after service go ahead praise the lord saints we praise the lord again we praise the lord again we praise the lord again hallelujah we came here last week and the fellowship and the welcome was so great we felt the presence of the Lord. And thank God for pastor, greetings pastor in the church family, a community church for the community, where there is unity. I love that. I love to feel the presence of the Lord and the freedom, sis. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And we love to sing. Thank God for my brother, Philip. I honor him, my eldest brother. You know, he, he groomed us. And taught us as we're growing up, 12 of us, my mother had, mother and father passed away, lost two sisters, 10 of us left. He's the first one on this first girl. But the Lord has blessed him with music, playing from five years old, self-taught. And then he trained the rest of my brothers and sisters to play. He's very dedicated, on time, disciplined very serious about his talent that the Lord has given him. Thank you, Jesus, for my brother. When my father and my mother got sick and they were passing away or got sick, I was traveling back and forth to Florida and I didn't know what to do. Lord, should I give up my job? What should I do? It was my brother Philip that prepared me for their passing, prepared us that we could stand strong today. And I used to see my father on his knees many times. Lord, rid me of any sin that my children would be polished stones in the house of the Lord, Pastor. And thank God, hallelujah, we are here today in destiny. Maybe it's my destiny to be here because I know the devil didn't want. He was fighting my voice. And your church has been in my spirit all week. And Pastor asked me, I was preparing my songs to sing. I said, Lord, <clears throat> if it's your will. Pastor said, pray about it. And then I, we came. I called my sister Josephine. She's always ready. At her age, she's always ready for Jesus. I've seen her growth in the Lord. We need the mothers in the church. We need the praying mothers. Hallelujah. Who can encourage us and encourage the younger ones. So I thank you today, Pastor. And I want to sing, I've got my mind made up. Because you've got the new ones coming in the community. God bless you. You have to have a mind made up to serve the Lord in these days. Hallelujah. I've got my mind made up and I won't turn back. You can sing, want to see my Jesus someday. Clap your hands. I've got my I wanna see my Jesus someday. I've got my mind made to hold and I hold. Turn back by His grace. Wanna see my Jesus someday. I've got my mind made up and I won't turn back. Wanna see my Jesus someday. Goodbye. Goodbye, pleasures of sin. I want to stay no longer with you. I made up my mind to 
Thank you so much, sis. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. singing and shaking and moving and just giving God his praise. Hallelujah. Amen. I, my, my mouth almost hurts. I've been smiling so much this morning. I tell you, that's how good God is, that no matter what we're dealing with, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. We run to it. We are looking forward to being in the kingdom, and his name is above all names. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is a word from the Lord today. Praise God. Sister Marcia, you said you forgot your glasses. I forgot my iPad. Amen. But the Lord always said, be ye ready. I print that out just in case because technology can break down. So we thank God that he is Jehovah Jireh. He provided some glasses for Sister Marcia. He provided my paper that we would have a thorough word this morning. Amen. Amen. So to God is all the glory, the honor, and the praise this morning. I want to start with our reading, then I'll say a short prayer. 
And again, I, I can relate to Sister Marcia this morning, and it lets me know that there's only one Holy Spirit that's speaking to the people of God. And all week as, you know, you're preparing and you're laboring before the Lord and you can get caught up in doing what's, uh, what we're accustomed to doing is what I should say. And as of late, when we come to give the word, sometimes it's just a verse or two or three, but the Lord told me to read his word today. Amen. Told me to read it at length. Amen. Bless the Lord. Amen. Bless the Lord. Amen. Told me don't hurry. He said, read my word. Because we're, sometimes we're just, we're in a hurry. And we want to take the shortcut and the short road. God said, read my word this morning. So I'm going to be reading from Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 to 6, and then we're going to do 10 to 19. Because the word of the Lord is a strong tower. I want to read this carefully, and I want to read it as God has laid it out for us. And it starts out in chapter 2 in the book of Exodus, talking about the birth of Moses. And it reads, Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Our children are familiar with this story. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. I remind those siblings, sisters and brothers, pay attention, see what's happening with your sister or your brother. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe. And her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then a sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the, I actually said verse 10, but I'm gonna keep reading, go right through, amen. The Lord didn't have me do that by accident. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Verse 9, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, another stage of Moses' life, when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and became, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. One day, after Moses had grown up, another stage of his life, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. Verse 15, when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian. And if you study Moses, we'll know that he was there for 40 years in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Ruel, also known as Jethro, their father, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? Verse 19 is their answer. They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. Father, your word is already blessed. 
We pray that the anointing that flows in your houses and this house around the world, God, would abide in your people. We pray that the Holy Spirit has its way today as it already has. We thank you, God, that deaf ears will be opened, blinded eyes will see, the growth of your people will increase even on today, that as a body of Christ will be edified, you will be glorified, and Father, your vessel moves out of the way so that your word may be imparted just as you have ordained. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. We pray, amen. Welcome once again to those who are here in the sanctuary, those who are joining us on YouTube, and those who may hear this message at another time. And we did this reading with purpose, that it would seep into our souls, that we would glean from the Word of God. And if I were to ask any of you for identification this morning, some of you might pull out your driver's license or students might pull out their school IDs indicating your first and your last name. That's who you might say you are. If you're seeking employment, you may be asked for a proof of identity, a social security card, your birth certificate, or other pertinent personal information. If I ask you who you identify as, you might say, and I pray you'd say, I'm a male, I'm a female, I'm a grandmother, I'm a friend, I'm a Christian, or some other recognizable classification. Today's message is entitled, Your True Identity Lies Within. Our divine identification lies within us. A Forbes article, the Forbes magazine uh, from June of 22 says, personal identity formation is impacted by various internal and external factors like society or family or friends or ethnicity or race or culture or location, opportunity, media, interest, appearance, self-expression, and life experiences. The Oxford Dictionary defines identity as the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. Is a drum, is a pen, is a pew, is children, first lady, the list goes on, who we identify as. The Oxford Dictionary also says the word identity is having a close similarity or affinity with something or someone. As Christians, we align ourselves. In other words, our identities are a state of being. They develop over time in stages. They define who or what we identify with, who or what we assimilate with, what we align ourselves with, whether we're aligning with the party or we're aligning with the praise, and praise can be a party. Praise to Jesus is a party. Who we are aligning with, what we are aligning, are we aligning with what we say we believe in? We call the name of Jesus, we, we say the prayers, we walk the walk and we talk the talk, but is it on the inside? Are we aligning, are we assimilating, are we defining who we say we are. Our identity lies within. Mankind has an attraction to the persons or things we identify with as we grow. We read about Moses and his growth from three months to getting older, to being older, to being a husband, to being a son-in-law. There's an old saying that says, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. And it has rings of truth to it. Because if you're hanging with the bullies, if you're hanging with the thieves, if you're hanging with the white collar crime, crime, people who are committing crimes, they just dressed up, but they still committing crimes with the IRS, with the government, and with their banks. So if you are aligning yourself with people like that, that tells me who you are. It tells God who you really are because he knows you. 
Proverbs 13 and 20 says, walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers from harm. The King James Version says, fools will be destroyed. So walk with the wise so you can become wise. You can identify with the wise. Assimilate, draw near, take in, absorb your beliefs in the very fiber of your being that you may grow and identify with wisdom. Be identified as wise, wise in the kingdom of God. Moses developed and he grew into who God called him to be. The text we read, it identifies and it marks the stages of Moses' identification process. And if you study the lifespan of Moses, you will find he identifies or he is called the son of Amrad and Jochebed. He's from the tribe of Levi. He has many names. He's the baby brother to Miriam and Aaron. He's an abandoned child separated from his parents at the Nile River Bank. He's known as a child hidden for three months. And God is strategic. Why three months? I said to myself, why three months? Because babies then, and we can't, we really can't include the babies today because they're a little different. They grew up a little different than the babies grew up back then. Amen? Because three months back then, they were still nonverbal. Their eyes didn't open when they were, when they were born today, their eyes are open. They moving at weeks old and turning over. But I want to go back to a little ancient time. I'm talking about that baby and Moses that was in the water. Amen? Amen. And he was able to stay quiet. And he wasn't as active. So he would not have been seen readily as he was in the Nile River waiting to be discovered in that vast body of water. The Nile River is one of the largest rivers in the world. And Moses, not yet named, is placed in the Nile River that Pharaoh's daughter would come to that particular place to pick up the baby who wasn't moving, who had been placed there, and she would find him. That's the God. That's the God. That's the God that we serve. And another message in that water, because the baby lied still. The baby lied still. And the sister, Miriam, was peeking from afar, watching what was going on with her baby brother. But the other message in that is, lie still until God is ready for you to be rescued. Lie still until he's ready for you to be rescued. Moses identified as being protected in the waters that should have killed him. He identifies as being nursed by his natural Hebrew mother. He is adopted by Pharaoh's daughter into an Egyptian household. He is called a murderer. He is called a hypocrite. He is called fearful. He is a fugitive. And he shows himself as he goes through the stages of his identification process. He shows himself to be a gentleman. When Ruel or Jethro's daughters came down to draw water, the other shepherds was moving them out of the way. You women, get up out the way. But Moses stood up for the women that they would draw water. And that's how come they got back home so early. Father asked how did you get back here so early this day? But God has us in place where we belong so we can serve our purpose. And he identifies us by our response to what he's called us to do. Moses identifies as a son-in-law of Jethro and a husband of Zipporah. He is called a father and a foreigner. But later in life, after going through some things, some valleys, some experiences, some mishaps, he would identify as the deliverer of God's chosen people. The word of God tells us in this world, you're going to have some trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. You're walking through the stages of life. There's a process. I'm still preparing you. I'm still working on you. I'm still calling you by the name that I have for you before I bring you home. 
Moses overcame his challenges such as stuttering and fear, and we have to walk. We have to still strive in our journey in the process. And it was for Moses as it is for us, our life stages, our life processes, our experiences identify us. And his experiences directly affect the inner man. Having the ability to illuminate our souls, provide teaching moments to rely on the almighty that we need to get out the way and let God work, drawing nearer to Christ in all circumstances, or rejecting the path already designed. God gives us choice. And saints, because our lives start out one way, do not, do not allow any lapses. My sister, do not allow any blunders or mistakes to hinder what God has called you to become, how his identity for you is to come forth. Moses was a murderer. God saw him as a leader, as his deliverer of his people. You know, maybe, maybe you've traveled through a foster care system, didn't feel fruitful. Maybe you don't have that career, that job you so desired. Maybe you didn't get into the school that you wanted. Maybe your money is low. Keep pushing. God has called you by name. He has defined your path, and he knows the journey that you're on. Who you are meant to be is a process that develops over time. Moses was abandoned at three months, but he ended up in the palace, and he became a great deliverer, just as God had called him to be. And we are reminded in Jeremiah 29 and 11, he said, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper and not to harm us, plans to give us hope and a future. And with each stage of our life for the believer, we are being defined, our personalities are changing, our spirit man is being edified. We are aligning more with the ways of God and coming into who God has called us to be. Who has he identified us as? He calls us his child. He calls us his children. 1 John 3 says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. We've been identified by God as his children. So in how we identify ourselves, how we are identified in the here and now, has much to do with our behavior, our beliefs, our perception by others, what I might call you, somebody else might call you something different. Depends on what you showed them. Depends on how you treated them. Depends on how you act when you come out of the pew and go out the door. Praise God, praise God. Our internal and external perception, our spirit and our flesh give us definition. When my nieces and nephews were younger, and, I, and I've said this before, they considered or they identified me as the uh, disciplinary aunt. That's, that's how they identified me. I took it well. I took it as a plus. They didn't want to come to my house. They still don't really want to come. Too many rules, too many things to do. And you also heard me say this before. I'm the older sister. So when my siblings would ask me to help them with their homework, they had a question and you know, you could look at the question and you really, somebody who knew the work could just give you the answer. But me, my identity, who God prepared me to be, we are gonna read the question that the teacher asked. What chapter is that in? My brother's shaking his head. We are gonna go back to the chapter. We are gonna go through the whole lesson and then all they want is the answer. <laughs> However, God prepared me to be someone of detail, amen? So he's preparing us even in those very seemingly insignificant moments, he's preparing our identity for when we grow up, amen? So everything that we do contributes to our identity. 
Amen. He's showing us. He's preparing us. And as we go through life, we encounter many crossroads. We reach milestones, challenges. We differ with people. Our emotions can get in the way sometime. And we develop attributes and characteristics that further identify us. And we were here on Friday for Brother McCalla's home going. And I heard name after name at his homecoming, homecoming that identified who he was yeah. and who he is. Yeah. He was called strong. Yeah. He was one that walked everywhere. He was one that was riding a bike still. He was loving to all, they said. He was stern. In his gentleness, he was stern. And his son-in-law told the story of how <laughs> He didn't want that relationship with, with the daughter. And, and fathers are protected over their daughters. You know, he didn't say anything that we don't experience. So he, he told the truth. He said he loved his pastor. He was a lover of God. He loved First Lady. He was a member of QCC. He was a member of Destiny Cathedral. He had so many names that identified him. It was clear who he was as they spoke, as they spoke of the stages of his life. And he identified most in importantly, as a child of God, yeah. a child of God. That's the identity that we want to have an affinity for. That's the identity that we want to say when people are looking at us, when they're calling our names, that's what we want them to say about us. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. What will people say about you when you transition? Yeah. Ah, my Lord, think about it. And yes, we always say we don't care what people think. We, we don't care what they think. And you're right in that. It, it really doesn't matter what they think. It matters that they saw Christ. Yeah. Doesn't matter what they think, but it matters if we call ourselves believers and they haven't seen Christ. It's like, oh, I didn't know he was a Christian. <laughs> the mouth on the job, the mouth at the school in the schoolyard, the mouth on the campus, the cheating, stealing, the paper from the office, paper clips, come on, everything counts. Everything, I'm speaking to me and I'm speaking to us. Okay, who do we really identify as? And we've reached a place in this life that is time to question ourselves. Thank you, Jesus. I'm talking to the believer, the one who says they're in Christ. And although we've been named at birth, this is just the beginning of who we are. We have a journey leading to our true divine identity. I want to look at three stages of Moses' life through three verses that we read today. First, in verse 6, and I just want to bring it back. This is Pharaoh's daughter. It says she opened, she opened it. We know that he was wrapped. He was in a basket. He was wrapped. And it says she opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. And she says, this is one of the Hebrew babies. How did Pharaoh's daughter know this just from seeing and hearing a crying baby? She identified the baby as a Hebrew. The baby couldn't talk. Baby didn't say, oh, I'm a Hebrew. My mother threw me in the water. Baby wasn't wearing the ID tag like they have in the hospitals now. So how did she know that he was a Hebrew babe? And if you go back to Exodus chapter 1, Pharaoh, he commands the midwives to kill all the baby boys at birth because, you know, the Hebrews are having a lot of kids and they got a lot of people coming and they're soon going to join up with the enemies and they're going to overtake us. So I need to kill all these little baby boys so we don't produce any more Hebrews. And it basically was a modern day genocide, looking to kill a future nation and a generation. But God is always in the midst. The midwives, they feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. They said, oh, I'm not killing those baby boys. I'm not doing that. I'll, I'll just tell the Pharaoh, they, they was delivering too quick. By the time I got there, sure they had that baby. So I, I can't help them. You know, they, they had to be born. 
So Pharaoh, he gives an order, and it's in Exodus 1 and 22, and it says that every boy that is born, every Hebrew boy that is born is to be thrown into the Nile. He was very clear in his edict where the Hebrew babies were to be thrown. So the baby in the Nile that Pharaoh's daughter would discover would be a Hebrew babe because nobody else is throwing their baby in the river. So the Hebrew babies had identification by being in the Nile because of the edict. And because Moses was already three months, Jewish tradition of circumcision would have already taken place on the eighth day. So when she unwrapped the babe, she would have seen a circumcised male. So the exterior factors would have played a role in identifying the Hebrew babe. Our identification comes from many factors. Second in verse 10, when the child grew older, again, another stage of life, when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. And it is here where Moses gets his name. Moses didn't have the name when he was born. He was identified and given the name Moses when Pharaoh's daughter did that. And she says, I'll name him Moses because I drew him out of the water. I drew him out. In the ancient days, names were given to children based on whom God called them to be, what their parents aspired them to be, or maybe an example of someone with noble character. Naming a child in a God-fearing family involves reverence. Not like today. Today, our children, not, not our children, not the children in here, but some children are named after liquors, some are named after colognes, some are named after colors, blue ivy, named by colors. Some have a sign, you don't even call a name. So a name to God for Christians is significant. It's important. It's valuable. It means something. It is your destiny. God called us by name. He didn't say chicky poo. He didn't say green, Miss Purple. He didn't say that. He called us by name. And because names played the major role in ancient days, God even himself he identified people and gave names to people before they were even born. That's how valuable naming in the ancient times was. In Genesis 16, 11, it says, an angel came to Hagar and said unto her, you shall bear a son and call his name Ishmael. In Genesis 17, 19, the God, um, God said, Sarah, your wife will bear a son and she shall call him Isaac. In 1 Kings 13 and 2, it says, A child shall be born into the house of David, Josiah by name. In Luke 1 and 13, the angel said, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth shall bear a son and shall call his name John. John the Baptist, who would be the forerunner for Jesus to Christ, was named before he came onto the earth. Naming is valuable. Naming who you're called, your identity is important. My father used to tell me, all you have is your name. I don't care what you do. I don't care when you get on that job. If they ask you if, you know, back in the day we had other jobs. I had to sweep. You had to clean bathrooms. You had to do all kinds. Of, he said, you'd be the best sweeper. Let them identify you as the best sweeper. It doesn't matter what the world classifies or what they say is valuable or uh, you, you're so called in this category of wealthy. It doesn't matter because the wealthy are not taking the wealth to the grave and it's a distractor on this earth to get close to God. So be the best you can be of who God called you to be. No part, we, we talked about this many parts of the body earlier. Pastor went into that scripture. Every part is important. The foot, the toe, the eye, the hand, all need each other. We are valuable in the sight of God. Amen. Matthew 1 and 21. She shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. 
God called these men and others before they were born, still in the womb. Our names are valuable. God even changed names throughout the Bible. Naming is so important. He allowed Adam, he allowed Adam after creation, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, and human is, is created. Adam is drawn from the dust of the ground, and he allows Adam to name all the animals and the birds of the sky. He told Adam that he could name his prized possession, his creation. And why do we think that God allowed Adam to do that? Was it just an assignment? Was it just something to pass the time by? He wanted Adam to recognize that everything that I have created is unique. Yeah. Everything that I have done, every vessel, every part of the skin, and after Adam names all of these animals and birds, and when Eve is taken from his rib, he calls her woman. He names her woman. And they recognize that they didn't look like the animals that Adam had named. They were unique. We are fearfully and wonderfully made in the sight of our God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God changed the names throughout the Bible. God changed Abram's name to Abraham. And he did this when he covenanted with Abraham. God blesses barren Sarai and changes her name to Sarah when the promised child, when the child was promised to her, Isaac. Jacob's name is changed to Israel as he submits and lets God prevail in his life. We have to submit unto the Father so that when we have that encounter, God can give us that new name. He can give us that new direction. He can give us a new hope. Simon was changed to Cephas or Peter when asked by Jesus, who do you say I am? What name do you call me? And Peter called him Messiah, Messiah. Saul was changed to Paul on the Damascus Road when he submitted to the will and the way of God. Our experiences give us our identification. Our experiences draw us closer to God. Our experiences allow us to internalize the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that transforms our lives in time, in the process, in the journey. God gave new names, he gave new beginnings, and he gave new hope. Your true God-given name is important to our Creator. Amen. We're special, we're unique, we're individuals, yet we're united in Christ. God said to his children in Isaiah 43 and 1, he says, but now, and he spoke to his children and he's always speaking to us in the word today because we can apply it ourselves. He said, he who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. I have summoned you by name. I have claimed you. You are mine. The enemy can not have you because you're mine and I've named you. I've given you an identity. We are identified by God. We belong to him. The doctor may identify you as sick, but God says you're healed. The bank manager may call you a borrower today, but you may own the bank and be the lender tomorrow. Your associate may see you as weak, but God sees you as an overcomer. The bully may see you as a target, but God says, if I be with you, who could be against you? My Lord, my Lord, he has claimed us, he has identified us, and I'm speaking to someone, I don't know if they're on, but even, even though your limbs have been taken, he said you will walk by faith and not by sight. Like you're unable to move because your limbs have been taken, but I am the Almighty God. I am 
the Jehovah Jireh. I am Jehovah Shalom. I am Elohim. I am El Shaddai. I am the one. I have called you by name. I know your nature. I know who I created. I know who I formed from the dust of the earth. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God has a name for you today and tomorrow. And once we internalize, once we adopt it, once we live out what he has deposited in us, we will see the promises of God. Matthew 10, 30 and 31. God even knows how many hairs are on your head. That's the level of detail that he has identified us with. So don't be afraid, you are worth much more than many sparrows. All those who stand before others and say they believe in me, I will say before my Father in heaven that you belong to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The third verse, verse 19 that we read from today, they answered, these are the daughters of Jethro, the seven daughters, and he wanted to know how they got back. You returned so early today. How did you get back so quickly? And they answered their father. They said, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. Now, we know that Moses is a Hebrew. Yes? But they identified him as an Egyptian. And they looked, we would imagine, at this outer garment. We know that he was in uh, Pharaoh's daughter's palace, trained as an Egyptian, learned the language, walked the walk, talked the talk. So when he fled, because he had to flee after the murder, after he felt he was discovered, I don't think he stopped to change his clothes. Amen? So when they saw him with their natural eye, they believed, they assumed he was an Egyptian. Don't allow other people to label you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We know this was done for God's purpose. We know that. But do not allow people to tell you who you are. Because we are in Christ. We identify with Christ. We know who's and who we are. So nobody out here can tell me anything about Buddha, who he says I am, who the friend says I might be. Don't claim it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are in Christ. Hallelujah. Moses fled from Egypt, and he was defined as an Egyptian. My question this afternoon to us is this. What garment are we wearing? Is it a garment of praise? Do your garments align with the Holy Spirit? Can we be identified as children of God by our garment? Have we grown? Are we still babes afloat in our own Nile River, waiting to be swayed by the movement of the water? Are we eating when the food has been placed before us, the Word of God? Are we coming to the table? Are we experiencing identity theft? Are we allowing Satan to steal our joy, our name? Are we allowing it? Are we allowing it? Are we allowing the devil to sift us? We have the best ID protection plan anyone could ever create. They're selling all these things on TV. You better get an ID protection. And, um, you know, I'm not all technical. I just know on the Internet they could get you. <laughs> That's all I know. They got my bank account one time, so I know it's true. <laughs> but we have, and I got all our money back, because we have the great ID protection plan. <laughs> Hallelujah. You could try to steal, but God going to give it back even more. Hallelujah. You got to know who you are in Christ. You got to tell, you got to speak to the people, you got to speak to the situation and tell them you can have it. And it might look like you stole but God just let you hold it for a moment because he's trying to increase me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We have the greater ID protection plan through Jesus the Christ. It's a plan that cannot be bought. It is gifted to his children. Amen. Have we allowed Satan to identify us as prey, P-R-E-Y, because we failed to P-R-A-Y? 
is the body of Christ experiencing an identity crisis? There are many questions to answer individually and collectively. Saints, we must remember who we are, even as we're surrounded by hate in this very country. We must not align or allow our children to absorb such things like what took place in Jacksonville, Florida on yesterday. Racially motivated killings once again. Young people being killed because of the color of their skin. Those thoughts and those spoon names of hate, they do not identify with who we are. Let us remember these families as they grieve, as the town grieves, as the nation grieves again. And we want to give God thanks because this person who also took his own life, three, I want to say students, if I got that right, three young people, but he had first gone to a nearby college campus and the security guard who's there to protect, thank God, refused to let him on campus because he didn't have identity. He didn't have an ID. Security guard would not let him in because he didn't have an identity. Who are we? We have an identity that is to be used for the grace of God. But in the natural, God did not allow him to cause more harm that could have taken place with, on the campus. Hallelujah. God has identified himself to us over and over, and he has told us who we are. He reveals his name to us just as he did to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Moses was about to carry out his assignment, and he was going to go to uh, Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, let God's people go. God sent me here. He told me to tell you, let my people out after all this oppression. And Moses says to God, he said, um, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That's what you're supposed to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. I am has sent us in this community. I am says we belong here. I am has identified us as a local assembly to be in this community. God also said to Moses in that same chapter, he said, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, because I'm telling you who I am, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. I am that I am knows us and has called us by name. Our true identity manifests through our transformation in Christ. And if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new is here. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. And we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. As we start to come to a close, today is the day to examine ourselves and ask ourselves some questions. Jesus' return is near. It's sooner than later. And if we don't know who we are, if we don't know whose we are, we'll be swayed by everything coming and going. Everything that's said on social media will fall right in. Everything that's spoken to us on the streets and the media will fall right in. We need to be aligned. We need to have an affinity. We need to draw near to Christ and to his word so that we can recognize truth for itself. And because Jesus loves us so much, he identified himself to us when he said in the Gospel of John, this is what he said, that I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, I am the true vine. And that's where we want to be connected to the true vine. So our identity is associated with Jesus the Christ. And when he died on the cross, he told us who he was. When he went to that cross voluntarily, 
He told us who he is, not who he was, because he is. 1 John 3 and 16 says, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. God's calling on our lives, our time, our circumstances, our responses, all attest to our true identities that live on the inside and are not determined by external man-conscious factors. Let us walk away today remembering this. Our identity is a classification that allows us to receive or not receive Holy Spirit deposits, to establish us as overcomers, to be called of God by name, our own identity. 2 Peter 3, 11 and 12 says, those who live holy before God without deceit will have their names written in the book of life. Revelation 2, 17, our last scripture for today. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on that stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. God has called us by name. He has already identified us as his children. To God be glory as we receive his word on today. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Your true identity lies within. Mark 7, Jesus said, there's nothing that goes, comes from outside into the stomach that can defile a person. He says, it's the things that comes from within to the outside that defiles a person. And so he says here, what comes from out of a person is what defiles them. Mark 7, 20. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, the evil thoughts come, sexual immorality comes, theft, murder, adultery, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly all these evils come from inside and this is why the word reminds us that we need to guard our hearts for out of it proceeds the issues of life wonderful word that causes us to do some self inspection let's search our hearts let's bow our hearts before the lord today father we ask you to search us search us for our true calling lies within us. Our true personality lies within us. We can dress ourselves up in all the bling and the most expensive garments that we can purchase. But who are we really? Are we covered in the blood of Jesus Christ? Are we being led by the indwelling Holy Spirit? Have we been allowing him to form us and mold us and melt us? Have we been allowing the word of God to transform the inner man so that the outer man can be seen as a new creation in Christ? If you're here today and you have never, never asked the Lord to transform your inner man, this is the day. This is the day to do it. Lord, we're so grateful today to be in your house. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the ministry of the song, the ministry of worship, the word of God. We thank God for Reverend Sandra, who poured her heart out today, encouraging us to discover our true self, recognizing that our true self lies within. We pray, God, that we will go through this week, feeding on this word, meditating on this word, remembering your word that says it's not what goes down into a person's stomach that defiles them. But it's the person inside coming out, the manifestation of who we really are that counts. So God, I pray that you will cover your people. Thank you for our new members that were received into fellowship today. 
Thank you for our brothers and sisters who join us from week to week on YouTube. We pray, oh God, that you will bless every home. Bless every home, Lord God, listening to this service, participating in this service by whatever means. And we give you thanks and praises for doing all these things. In Jesus' name, and everyone says, bless you, bless you, bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon in the Lord. God bless you.